The following is a presentation of the Healthcare Facilities Network. Hello, welcome to the Healthcare Facilities Network. I'm your host, Peter Martin of Gossam Martin Associates and the Healthcare Facilities Network. As always, thank you for clicking on this video, which is episode two of History's Facility Managers, Parkland Hospital and the JFK Assassination. If you have yet to see episode one, I will link to it at the conclusion of this episode. But I want to do this brief intro as we uh, unveil this particular episode, just to say uh, thank you to my two guests who joined me. They are Dave Neely. Dave is the Director of Facilities Management up at Maine Medical Center in Portland, Maine, and Jeff Henney. Jeff is uh, Manager of Security Emergency Management Safety down at UPenn Health, University of Pennsylvania Health System in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So thanks to those two gentlemen. You know, this episode's a little bit different than what we normally do. The idea for this episode, we're working with, um, working with a search engine optimization firm. I know nothing about SEO and backlinks and all of the stuff that, that YouTube and Google does um, relative to linking videos to other videos, et cetera, et cetera. But we're working with this company, and there's a gentleman named Zaid. And uh, I was talking to Zaid, and he was telling me he's not an American citizen, but he was saying that he likes JFK likes learning about history, and we were talking about the assassination, and he said, you should do a show on that. And so I thought, well, I guess we could do a show from the perspective of Parkland Hospital and the Director of Facility Management at the time. And even though, you know, back in 1963, they probably didn't have a director or manager of emergency management, safety, security, um, they're obviously important figures. And so these two episodes looks at the uh, impact of the JFK assassination on the Director of Facilities Management and his team and on safety and uh, emergency management and his team and so Jeff and Dave have both uh, they both went back in time for this one so they put on their hats like they were in Parkland Hospital in 1963 and that was the discussion we tried to combine a little of 2024 with 1963 so we we bounce back and forth, especially in the first episode, um, talking about the interactions of today between facilities management and emergency management and safety and security and how they are intertwined. And so it's an interesting episode. I enjoy history. So if you actually have an idea for an episode similar to this, history's facility managers, uh, I'm always happy to, happy to hear them. And so feel free to bring them forward. I know, you know, I've worked with Jeff in the past, and Jeff loves American history, so he's a good guy always to go with, and I know Dave, and Dave is, uh, Dave is always eloquent and, and, and speaks well, and so I thought these two would be great guests. And so with that, um, we present History's Facility Manager, Episode 2, Parkland Hospital and the JFK Assassination, and again, we're looking at it from those three days, we actually start November 21st, and we go through November 24th. So we look at those three days through the eyes of the people who were running Parkland Hospital. As always, thank you for watching, and now on to the show. I guess then, coming in at 12.38 p.m., which is when the, that gurney <laughs> enters that emergency room they were in, he was in trauma room number one. Um, you know, the Secret Service enters, they're in charge, right? Jeff, you were talking about going on the offensive as opposed to being on the defensive when they come in. What's the first, relative to the when the Secret Service comes into your hospital, whomever that policy is for, what is the first thing that your policy reads? What do you do? Well, it's, it's, if it's the ED, you know, you're going to have the staff create a huddle because we'll hear it over. Back then, they didn't have, like, the, it's called the HAVE system. Here for the city of Philadelphia. It's a what's it called, Jeff? A what system? H-A-S-T-E. H -A -S -T -E. It's for the fire board from the city of Philadelphia. So you would hear those alerts in the overhead coming in. Um, back then, they didn't have that. Yeah. So yeah. they probably just heard something, and they didn't have a bunch of people rolling up to your hospital. Um, and back then, it was an army probably swarming your you know, ED. Yes. Um, you <laughs> probably had only a few seconds to a few minutes just to create a quick huddle to try to clear out as much as you can to secure whatever you need to secure your, your, your trauma or recess day areas. Um, and then we have a, a series of communication tiers uh, that can go out very quickly to, uh, you know, obviously me, but to leadership, 
senior leadership, and also um, your public information officer, um, because you're, you're, you're going to have people trying to come in, go undercover, try to get picks, you know, um, the staff know not to do that type of stuff, yeah. but, you know, um, but, you know, you want to kind of lock down. And back then, you could point back to, in the 60s, you could see somebody walk in with a gigantic camera. Right. You could know there wasn't being repressed. Now, it's as, it's as much as a, as a pen. Yeah. Well, you know, and, you know, that in and of itself is huge. Just kind of think about that. Now it will be on Twitter. You would have the paparazzi coming into that hospital so quickly it would be flooded with it. Yeah, and you read, you know, back then, just in 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 doing some of the research, you know, they called stat. That's how the doctors came down into the room. It sounded like people were while the Secret Service controlled it. Docs are coming in and out. Mrs. Kennedy is there in the corner, and you know, they asked one of the doctors his opinion, and and he was very graphic about it. And then he said, "I looked over to my left, and there she is standing there." So a very type of, you know, chaotic scene, but it was a different time, right? Yeah. Uh, and then trying to just maintain, uh, back then, like like Dave said, they would swarm in and push everybody out, and, you know, <clears throat> take over versus today, you know. Uh, but then, you know, you don't want to make it too offensive or afraid to staff and other patients that are there. It's yeah. a different mentality than it is today versus back then, you know. Um, I'm going to defend my hospital like a port, you know, I know, I know it's about another patient, but at the same time, I don't want, I don't want people, I don't want staff and patients to become afraid or intimidated by right. guys in black on black suits and then guys with AR-15 standing around, yeah. um, you know, because they will be around him or her, um, you know, depending if it's a president or a dignitary uh, for that piece. So again, working with police local PD, you know, doing those walkthroughs like me and Dave have been through, helps out and you get some familiarized with the facilities. Uh, versus back then, they probably didn't do a lot of um, walkthroughs of hospitals like they do today. Um, yeah. You know, they probably have their certain hospitals in their mind where they would take them, you know, in different areas, you know, a city like NYU, you know, Parkland, Walter Reed, um, you know, et cetera, throughout the country. Um, but, you know, versus today, they have a lot of they have a huge itinerary of um, <laughs> different hospitals they go through, you know, just a pinpoint. So, you know, I, I think about the um, until the Bushes came to Kenny Bunkport in Maine, I'm, I'm going to think that nobody really thought of New England as a place that anything like this could happen. Hmm. Uh, that, you know, everything would be centered around Boston. Yeah. Any event that were to, to occur north of Boston would fly into Boston. Uh, but that that time has certainly changed. Yeah, no, it it, it really hasn't. You know, I, I was interested, you know, you brought it up there, Jeff, talking about like, there are obviously, this is a hospital, so it's not shutting down because the president there, because you already have patients in there. So William Manchester uh, wrote a book. It was called The Death of a President. I had to read a William Manchester book when I was in high school. Um, it was large and thick but it was really good. That's the only, like, we used to have to read it every day. It was like 750 pages at the time. Seemed like it would take forever to get through. The Glory and the Dream was the name of it. Have you guys ever read The Glory and the Dream? No. It's William Manchester. But anyways, he wrote a book about the assassination, the death of a president. And he said, a boy, Ronald Fuller, was in the hospital. He was bleeding from a fall. A man, Carl Tanner, had severe chest pains. A woman, Ada Byers, complained of nervousness. Staff treated 272 patients a day, one every five minutes in 1963. At the instance of John Kennedy's murder, 23 people were receiving attention for automobile injuries, animal bites, delirium treatments, interesting the way they phrase that, delirium treatments, infections, and suspicious discharges. So you had the 23 patients, and then John Conley, the uh, governor of Texas, was in trauma room two. So you had Kennedy in trauma room one. You had Conley, who was also obviously shot in trauma room two. And then you had all of those patients. So certainly a, a chaotic scene in that uh, that brief area. What would you guys, um, and again, even team, you know, team dynamics are different now, collaboration, uh, communication, all of those things are kind of constant these days. You guys are always thinking about your, you know, the, the folks who report up to you and your team members, but 
if you know the secret service is in charge do you do anything and communication is different as well but anything to your team at that moment are you you do you want to talk to them do you want to gather them together huddle what are you thinking relative to what is your team doing and and what do i need to do for them this is peter martin if you or your organization is interested in advertising or partnering with the healthcare facilities network including sponsoring content then please email me using the barcode in the lower right of your screen from the trades level to the vice president level, from planning, design, construction, project management, compliance, safety, and security, the Healthcare Facilities Network reaches FM people where FM people are. You know, typically the, the protocol is the, the engineering team that are in the building would report to a location, typically back to one of the shops, uh, waiting for direction. So my I would expect that the Secret Service would have their uh, their their huddle set up. Um, we would have our incident command team set up, and there'd be a liaison between our incident command team and the Secret Services incident command team. But then a liaison from our team back to the engineering department, and we would be there for any support that was needed. If there were back doors that needed to be covered, so no one was going to come in those doors and and sneak in, we'd be there. If they needed um, help transporting patients around to free up space, uh, that's that's the kind of role that the engineering team would be called to, to participate in. Um, for the security team, a real a real incident, they're not gonna have enough people in the building. Yeah. And the beauty of it is, well, we all carry radios. So it's a, it's a really quick, easy way to communicate with a lot of people very quickly. And I, I think during a, a you know, we, we plan for all kinds of things, every incident that could come at us. But the, the, in fact, our security director and I were talking about this the other day. We plan for all kinds of stuff, but push comes to shove when the event happens. It's 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 it, it's seat of the pants management. Mm -hmm. You have to adjust to the particular situation. Yeah, and I I think the other really complicating part is, you know, we plan for all these things, but most of our planning is around a full staff in the house. <laughs> well, the full staff is here Monday through Friday. Uh, you know, 7A to, to 4P. The rest of the time, it's not a full staff. Uh, so, you know, we, we concentrate our effort on normal business hours, but we have to have a whole different protocol for after hours. I mean, if an event mm -hmm. like this happened on a Saturday, there'd be a heck of a lot less people in the building yeah. to manage the situation than there would be on a, on a Tuesday. Yeah. Yep. And I, I agree with Dave. A lot of times things happen at night or weekends. So it's, you know, skeleton crew or the Alamo trying to defend until we can bring help in. Um, but it also comes down to communications and how you set up those levels of communications. You know, um, uh, today, if there's a ton of, at our fingertips to use between uh, radios, mass notifications, texts, emails, overhead announcements, you know, um, back then and in, in, in when this happened, um, the only thing you probably really had was maybe an overhead announcement system, yeah, um, and then the fire alarm system. But even then it was just bells. You know, it wasn't like you have today where you can pick up a mic and use it, you know, and do an announcement, you know, or have pre-canned messages. There was nothing back then. Yeah. Um, it was just all either telephone, the old rotary phone back then. Uh, yeah. Folks. <laughs> well, text messaging for Twitter or Facebook or, yeah. you know. But today there are, there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, we talked about a few minutes ago, like trying to stay on top of uh, alerts and stuff. And there's websites out there to help you, like data miner and other and other type of stuff that help you keep alert of events or situations, like car wrecks. Plus, mm -hmm. it might be an MCI with a bus, you know, within our city, um, water main break. You know, we had like, we've had two in the city the last couple of days, and then um, you know, or uh, you know, talking with Dave and also with severe weather. Um, you know, so there's the communications today versus back then. It's like Starship Enterprises versus. <laughs> did, you know. you, did you guys see? So again, we're recording this uh, January 23rd. So there was an ice storm in the south yesterday. Um, southwest. Did you guys see there was a video? It was on Twitter, of course, because everything is on Twitter. I think it might have been Nashville. The fire truck nope. sliding on ice and whirling <laughs> around through it. <laughs> that nice. thing is kind of going downhill and it's twirling. It's unbelievable. Absolutely no control because it got caught on the ice. So yeah, you're you know, 
it's funny. It's there's so much out there. You mentioned um you mentioned the phone and communication. So um in Manchester's book, um, the Army Signal Corps commandeered Parkland's outgoing lines, but that still left incoming ones to be handled by the regular switchboard operators. Dave, I know in your past you've had telecom, right? Um, oh yeah, yeah. So these phone operators were soon overwhelmed. Manchester writes already UPI bulletins. So UPI, if you're too young, AP and UPI, United Press International, was a, a new was a news organization well before Twitter. They would write news articles. So that's who UPI is. They're gone. Um, UPI bulletins were stimulating crank calls all over the world. In the next two hours, one girl, Phyllis Bartlett, she worked at Parkland, would log conversations with England, Canada, Australia, Venezuela, France, and Mexico. She wrote, every call coming in long distance is urgent, and everyone seems to have a title that demands priority. Most calls were not legitimate. Some were. Genuine insiders got through as Ethel Kennedy, who was Bobby's wife, got through. So it's very interesting to think about all those, everything we kind of take for granted now, you know, back in those days. And I guess added to the security, at the time Oswald hadn't been arrested. So they, for all they knew, that killer is still out there somewhere. Now, it's probably not necessarily a priority for you, but I got to imagine Secret Service is like, we don't know who did this or where they are. Yeah. Also, there's no street cameras like there are today. There's no ring cameras like there are today. Uh, you know, back then. You know? <laughs> yes. So there's been old school deductive reasoning, you know, or like causal tree effect analysis, where you go from words to you know back to backwards to try to recreate the scene and figure out, you know, who was in there interviewing old school interviewing people that type of stuff. Yeah, old school police work. Old school, right? old school police work. You know, you see, and I'll I'll put one up in this. You see the pictures, the black and white pictures of what it was like when the um when the limo pulls into Parkland and people just scattering all over. Jeff, I know you like history. I always look at those pictures, and you just wonder, like, what are people thinking? They're probably just doing at that moment. But you know, looking back in time, what what is their thought process? And because we know the well, we don't know the answers now. Always know the answers now. <laughs> But we know a lot more than they did at the time when they're entering Parkland and just commandeering that hospital for the president. Um, so, you know, with, with the world kind of going crazy in your hospital in 1963, what are you, you you've met with your staff. What, what else you tell, like, are you playing a little bit? And, and again, we're different now than they were then, but are you playing a little motivational leader or what is your approach with, with them? You know, you always, you always have to support staff through an incident like that, like that, any, any incident, um, because pe people will become discouraged and depressed and yeah. you got to keep, keep them rolling. I mean, I, I think back to September 11th mm. and I was in New Jersey and the, the disruption to the hospital was just extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, and and you, we did need to pull people together and say, okay, guys, it's a horrible situation, but we, we got a job to do Great example. and we have to, we have to keep pushing, uh, and, and do our job. So, um, yeah, you do, you do have to constantly reinforce with staff. Um, I, I think about the Lewiston shooting and the, we had people staff that were on lockdown in Lewiston because this guy was still loose. I mean, my, much like you were just saying with was with Oswald well, still being loose. Um, we didn't know where this guy was, mm. and you know the hospital here, the Lewiston is is a half hour away, and we're on lockdown. Yeah. Every door of the place is locked, and and we're uh, watching everything. Well, at two o'clock in the morning, I reached out to my staff and said, "Guys, how are we doing? Is every are you guys okay?" And reminded them that they needed to continue to be vigilant as they go outside the building because you don't know what you're going to run into so yeah i do think it is really important to continue reinforcing with staff that we will get through this uh and make sure we provide whatever resources we need for them yeah i mean to that point dave it's, it's after the fact also to get like hr involved pastoral care involved to get um, any emotional support for people they might not want to talk to you you know um a lot of people you know um, they might want to, you know, talk to somebody offline in more of a private setting. So having those services set up 
you know, they, again, they, they didn't have a lot of that back then, you know, yeah. like they do, you know, yeah. having to even support uh, pastoral care, you know, HR to help support staff wellness. Yep. You know, and because they don't want to take it home with them, uh, you know, and they want to be able to, uh, you know, uh, show that I mean, we, we all we all do care for our employees, but they go above and beyond what we've done before. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that would they have done um would they have done like an after incident huddle to best practices command? Do you think they would have done any of that in retro? Would they have thought to do any of that? Or it's just speculation. But what you would today, what would you do? What do you think they would have done then? I would hope they would take advantage of the opportunity, but I yeah. Yeah, I, I was I was four. Okay, so I don't really know. <laughs> well, no, <yeah. laughs> okay, just speculation, Dave. Just I'm not. I know you I, weren't on scene. <laughs> I I would certainly but, hope that yeah. at a minimum, the ED staff would would pull everybody together and security would pull their teams together, and talk about the things that went well and the things that didn't go well. Um, but you know, a, a, an after action was is something we do today for everything. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, you have a snowstorm and you have an after action. Uh, event. <laughs> you guys would be all over it. Oh, yeah. yeah. But so probably too much. So but what about what do you think about that? Probably not. Certainly not to the extent that we do today. Yeah. Um, but I, I would I would think that any any good manager would would pull their staff together and and, and talk it through. I mean, to today's point back then, you know, there wasn't a Hicks forms for emergency management use, right? Nationally set up back then. You know, a lot of them started, you know, the California wildfires, you know, and developed over time, you know, through the 70s, you know, into the 80s, uh, you know, with NIMS, uh, you know, like I said, the dawn of emergency management. Um, so back then, you know, the Secret Services and police are doing an investigation because it's a murder scene. Yeah. But, you know, I hope that you know, on the high side, if somebody did pull a huddle, that'd be great, but I'm not going right. to hold my breath. Well, you know, and that they, we do it today, or even like a, a fifth of what we do it today, you know, back then. Yeah, yeah. Well, it says, you know, Kennedy, um, Kennedy was out of Parkland by two o'clock. And so, you know, he gets in at 1238. He's gone by two in, in, in something I was reading. Doris Nelson, she was the head nurse in the emergency room at two o'clock. She ordered EVS. You know, she, well, I'm, I'm using EVS. She probably ordered trauma room one cleaned. So, you know, like think of that in the context of today. Now, what's interesting, if you listen to the, uh, there's obviously the magic bullet theory, right? Which they talk about a lot in this podcast and you can find a lot, but the magic, where the where the bullet was found on the gurney is really interesting. It's interesting to me, forget the magic bullet part of it, but like imagine today, they're cleaning the room at two o'clock, the gurney's there, a bullet is found hours after, <laughs> like hours after the president is already gone. So it just, it speaks to just a different level then, then that would never occur today, right? Never. <laughs> it's just, it's like the stone ages compared to now. And I don't know which is better, the stone ages or now, I, that's up for debate, but. <laughs> I, I would think today they would do a forensic analysis on every yeah. piece of dust in the Everything. room. Everything. Right. Yeah, and it would take days. Doris Nelson isn't taking over trauma room one for the next patient at two o'clock. Now we would just seal the room up until the Secret Service clears it. Yeah. You know, it's, or FBI, whoever, you know. Uh, but even then, you know, uh, there would probably be a couple days. That right. <laughs> right. Just completely different. So on so this obviously happens on a on a Friday. On so on Saturday, you know, kind of that middle day, do you guys think you're you're into work that day? Back in 1963, do, do, do you go in, you, your team go in? Is it a decompression day? What do you think you did on that Saturday? I don't think they did anything. Yeah. <laughs> I think they took their weekend. Yeah, yeah. Take, take their weekend. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would think today we might do the same thing. Just uh, I would think bit. there'd be some senior level calls Friday night and, and potentially Saturday. Uh, at the same time, the Secret Service might still be interviewing people on Saturday, mm -hmm. calling people in specifically for interviews. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you guys are, so back in 1963, you guys are both taking the day off. Slackers. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also thinking on the other side of this, you know, yes, but I think there'd be a lot of mourning, especially in the city. Yeah, and, yes. 
lot of people were, were sad everywhere, you know, and very shocked. So I still think, you know, um, the news and media will still be around there reporting out, um, you know, um, pre-taping things back then because, you know, wasn't there was some live streaming on 3, 6, and 10. That was it back then. Right. Right. With the 3,000 channels or plus we have now. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I, like today, you know, I think that people go back to work, but, you know, I think there still will be a, an essence of, of instant command today just because of the news and media still trying to report out things and try to, you know, not have them access your facility, you know, to try to get any type of staff uh, right. information, little tidbits that they can use or run with, you know, so I don't trust the media one bit. Yeah. Um, so I call it shock media. They want to, they all want the stories. They don't care who they run over. Yeah. Do you guys do, you, I mean, it's not prevalent, but if something occurs, do you counsel, not counsel, but do you talk to your staff, Jeff, maybe it's a little bit more with you being down where your location is. You counsel them on talking to the media and being, especially with HIPAA, with, with everything today. You have to talk about it, right? It's the same thing if you have a, a regulatory person come in like OSHA, DEP, Joint Commission, CMS. You know, you want to, our front staff, you know, um, want to make sure, hey, you know, and then have security kind of escort them to a couch or seating area and say, somebody be right with you and keep an eye on them. Um, because, you know, at the same time, um, I would still have my facility locked down um, because I don't want people trying to, I have a lot of interest, as I'm sure Dave does too at his facility, um, um, I would lock down and have people still post there to keep an eye on, make sure everyone has their ID badges yeah. that they're supposed to come in, who they are supposed to be, who they are. I don't want people trying to sneak in. It's interesting to me on, so the 23rd, then we come November 24th, Lee Harvey Oswald is shot. Harvey Lee Harvey Oswald is taken to Parkland Hospital. Lee Harvey Oswald is taken to Trauma Room 2, where Conley is, right across the hall from where JFK was kept talking about kind of the trauma and the communication i'd imagine for those employees in your departments that monday is quite the day <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh they were right on the lines of historical of history probably didn't even know it at the time gentlemen i appreciate your time anything in closing that we didn't get to or any thoughts that you had any any anything to to bring up that that we just didn't get to during the call. And I appreciate your time and your, uh, you know, obviously your thoughts. Anything you want to finish with, I'll give you guys the last word. No, it was a very interesting conversation. Um, you know, I, I was young at the time. I do remember it vaguely. Um, but it, this certainly stirred some thoughts and some memories. So I do appreciate your time and Jeff, your time as well. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Jeff, you good? Or no, history yeah. guy? Um, no, I love the, I love the mixture of the topic we had. It's, it's different, you know. If we ever do this again, it'd be cool. It'd be yeah, yeah, wow. absolutely. I I love bringing the two together because I like both of them. Um, yeah. So we have my guest, Dave Neely, Maine Medical Center. Jeff Henney, UPenn Health. Gentlemen, thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Peter. Thank, thank you, Jeff. you, guys. Peter Martin from the Healthcare Facilities Network. As always, thank you for tuning in, and we'll be back.